The AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click Donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, Janelle Jones of the Economic Policy Institute on Black Unemployment and the Truth Behind the Numbers. Kevin DeGood of the Center for American Progress fact-checks Donald Trump's promise to repair America's infrastructure. And Bill Press talks with Kyle Kondik, managing editor of Sabato's Crystal Ball, on the path for Democrats in 2018. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. In his State of the Union address, President Trump bragged about and took credit for a drop in black unemployment. Economist Janelle Jones says that number alone says very little about what needs to be done to achieve equity for African Americans in the workplace. And we say hello to Janelle Jones, economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, where she works with the EPI's program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, and the Economics Analysis and Research Network. She also has worked as an economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Janelle Jones, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, and it's our pleasure to have you with us. You know, President Trump recently tweeted about historic lows in unemployment for African-Americans and Hispanics. And of course, he congratulated himself. We want to kind of unpack this picture in terms of what's true, what's not true, and what's missing. So to begin, is there some real good news here? So shockingly, he is right. There actually is some good news. So a falling black unemployment rate is a positive thing. And what we've seen over the past couple of years is that as the economy has kind of been trending towards full employment, um, which means that the, the national unemployment rate is falling, employers are really expanding their hiring networks. And when they do this, they tend to bring in more racial minorities who have been left out of uh, the labor market. So low unemployment kind of pulls these historically disadvantaged groups in from off the sidelines brings them back into the labor market. And this is what we're seeing in the black unemployment or unemployment rate. Um, and it's one reason why the Federal Reserve kind of held off on interest rates. So we know that we wanted to keep interest rates low, keep the economy growing. And we know that that's good for black workers. And that's basically what we've seen over the past couple of years. Now, in terms of what's missing, the president isn't tweeting about how black and Hispanic unemployment compares to white unemployment. You track this story very closely. What do we need to know? So I think the context for this is that historically, since this measure has been tracked, the black-white unemployment ratio has been about two to one. So black unemployment rates have been about twice as high as white unemployment rates. And that is still very much true. It's narrowed very slightly to about 1.85, but that's not great. And I don't think if like the white male unemployment rate was nearly 7%, we would be celebrating. So I'm not sure we get to set a very low bar for economic success for black workers and then applaud ourselves when we actually reach it. Um, so and in part because we know that these differences in unemployment rates, a large part is driven by just plain racial discrimination. Um, so there's still this huge gap between white and black work unemployment rates. And that's something that we really have to keep in mind, even as the black unemployment rate falls. Now, and of course, as you know, this isn't just an employment gap. It's also a wage gap. Can you explain that for us? Sure. So a really, really important paper by my colleague Valerie Wilson from last year shows that the racial wage gap between black and white workers has actually been growing since 2000. And this is, I mean, this is crazy and sad, but it's also like a really important point to keep in context. So sure, we're bringing in black workers, they're getting jobs, but what are their wages? What are their benefits? What are the qualities of these jobs? Because if you bring black workers in and you basically have them overrepresented among low-wage workers, 
I'm not sure how great a success that really is. And something else that we see um, in this report is that this, this gap in wages holds for all sorts of breakdowns by family structure, by education. So you'll have, you know, white and black people who both have college degrees and without a doubt, on average, black people are going to earn less. We're speaking with Janelle Jones, an economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute here on americasdemocrats.org. Janelle, you co-wrote an article last July with this stunning headline, Black women have to work seven months into 2017 to be paid the same as white men in 2016. That kind of leaves your head shaking. So what are the (laughs) obstacles that black women face in the job market? Right. So this this paper that you're referring to, we wrote for Black Women's Equal Pay Day. And yeah, what you said is right. Black women basically have to work seven months into 2017 to be paid what a white man was in 2016. Um, and the obstacles for black women are something, you know, that I think that we know, but that we really have to keep calling out because the obstacles are not being overcome. So one is like this intersection of racial discrimination and gender discrimination hits women of color particularly hard. And we see this because black women are paid 67 cents on the dollar relative to white men, even after you control for education, years of experience and location. Your work also corrects some of the myths that persist about African-American and Hispanic unemployment. One of those myths is that white workers simply work harder than black workers. Please, what is wrong with that statement? Oh, just saying it hurts, just hearing someone say it actually hurts because it is so unbelievably untrue. And some work I'm doing with a colleague, Valerie Wilson, on the work hours for African-American workers shows that this is unbelievably false. Since 1979, the largest increase in annual work hours has been low-wage African-Americans. So these are people whose wages are not even that great, and they are spending an enormous amount of time at work. And when you take people who are in the labor market, when you, look to black, when you look at blacks and whites, they actually work very similar hours. The problem is getting people into the labor market. The problem is the obstacles that are keeping people disconnected from working. But once they're able to get a job and work, they actually work very similar hours. And we see this enormous increase for women, for black women and for white women. Uh, but black women have always worked more than white women, and that continues to be true and has historically been true. Mm. And here's another myth. It says that if blacks just got more education, they could close the wage gap. Again, what's wrong with that statement? I mean, I don't I I probably say once or twice a day that education does not offset the effects of racial discrimination. And we see this everywhere. We see this all over the labor market. So we know that educational attainment for black workers, especially black women, has grown significantly over the past couple of decades. But we still see discrepancies in those returns to education in terms of wages and unemployment. So at every level of education, the black unemployment rate is higher for blacks than for whites. And at every level of education, blacks earn less than whites. So we really can't, you know, use education to solve the problems of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. In tweeting about African-American and Hispanic unemployment, the president also said, quote, Dems did nothing for you, but get your vote, close quote. Is he right about that? I mean, I think it's going to be very shocking for me to say, but no, of course not. Is there more work that can be done for black workers, particularly low-wage black workers, by both Republican and Democratic administrations? Of course. But I can't imagine that the kind of attacks on workers we have seen over the past year in terms of the tax bill, health care, wage stagnation, the amount of like really terrible labor policy that is coming out of the NLRB, I can't imagine any of that being pushed through a Democratic administration. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely room on both sides. But what we've seen, particularly with the black unemployment rate, that is because of sound economic policy that was decided long before Trump got into office. So the economy was well on its way to full employment and it has stayed that course. Um, And this is this was happening before January of 2016. So I think, you know, in part, I mean, a large part, most of what we owe this low unemployment rate to is to the democratic economic policies of the past eight years. Mm -hmm. Now, before we let you go, if a president really wanted to take on employment and wage disparities, what kind of policies would we be seeing? 
Yeah, this is a good question and something that we get all the time. I mean, I think in terms of like big, large scale dreams, I mean, the thing that's really going to solve this is seriously tack- tackling racial and gender discrimination. And we do have, I mean, we do have a Department of Labor. There's a way that you can kind of enforce discrimination and make sure people pay when they when they do it. We haven't seen that be the case with the current Department of Labor, uh, so I'm not sure how likely that would be. Another policy that we push here at EPI all the time is full employment. And I think, you know, what we're seeing are really the outcomes of full employment. The reason why we're seeing such low unemployment rates for blacks is because we are really pushing to get to full employment for the full economy. Um, another thing that comes up all of the time is giving workers the right to collectively bargain. Um, so unions are amazing for workers, but particularly for black workers. We see that they earn more, they have more benefits, their work-life balance is better. Um, there's all sorts of um, work benefits for workers who are in unions. Um, another thing that comes up is pay transparency. So when you don't have, like, you know, these cloak and dagger back rooms where pay is negotiated, we see actually much more equality across gender and across race. Um, And in terms of wages, another thing that we can always do is to increase the minimum wage. This really brings up the wages of so many workers at the bottom and gives them a better standard of living. And they turn around and spend those increases in their their paychecks. I mean, there's the other thing. And they... they spend it right away. So it really is a form of stimulus because they're really not going to hang on to it. They spend it right back in the economy. Sure. All right. Janelle Jones, economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Janelle, thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate it and look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. You're quite welcome. Thank you. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Kevin DeGood of the Center for American Progress says President Trump's infrastructure plan is exactly not what America needs. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Donald Trump bragged in 2016 that, quote, I know words. I have the best words. Well, occasionally he does use some very fine words that convey great promise, as in this sentence. I'm going to fight for every person in this country who believes government should serve the people, not the donors and special interests. Trump also declared he would, quote, drain the swamp to rid Washington of those creepy, crawly special interest lobbyists. Excellent words. But they only matter if the speaker actually means them, backing their rhetorical promise with action. As we've seen, though, far from draining the swamp, Trump converted the White House itself into a fetid cesspool of lobbyists, corporate executives, and banksters. His transition team was almost exclusively made up of those swamp critters. His glitzy inaugural celebration was bankrolled by Big Oil, Big Coal, Big Pharma, and other bigs that attached their legislative and regulatory demands to the checks they donated. 
most of his top officials come straight out of Wall Street and corporate suites, turning Trump's government into a sump pump that is routinely funneling billions of dollars in special regulatory favors to the moneyed elite. When asked why he put Wall Street hucksters in charge of economic policy, he offered this scramble of words that inadvertently revealed his true plutocratic soul. I love all people, rich or poor, but in these positions, I just don't want a poor person. This is Jim Hightower saying, really? Not even one official who understands poverty from firsthand experience and could not only give you advice, but also some understanding? And what about those hard-hit middle-class workers Trump always talks about? Nope, he hasn't appointed a single one to a top policy position. So forget Trump's words. If the poor and middle class aren't in his government, they're not in his heart either, nor in his policies. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. From the early days of his campaign, President Trump said he would repair the nation's infrastructure and make it second to none. From what he's heard so far, infrastructure analyst Kevin DeGood says that plan will fall far short of its promise. And we say hello to Kevin DeGood, Director of Infrastructure Policy at American Progress. His work focuses on how highway, transit, aviation, and maritime policy affect America's global competitiveness, access to opportunity for diverse communities, and environmental sustainability. He's also the author of Thinking Outside the Fare Box, Creative Approaches to Financing Transit Projects. Kevin DeGood, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you for having me. Now, our pleasure to have you with us. President Trump says he would deliver, or he said that he would deliver a massive infrastructure plan to Congress when the, within the first 100 days. That didn't happen. Now he's promising we will hear something soon. Do you think that will happen? Yeah, by all accounts, we expect to get some more details about what the Trump administration is thinking um, before the State of the Union. At least that is what the the current rumors are in Washington, always subject to change, of course. But uh, it it seems as though they're actually trying to put the finishing, uh, finishing touches on it. And again, we expect something in the next maybe two weeks. Now, back in June, the White House did release a fact sheet outlining President Trump's infrastructure priorities. Do you see anything that looks promising there? Or on the other hand, do you see any red flags that cause you particular alarm? Yeah, you know, that initial release didn't have very much detail in it. I think the way that I have been sort of filtering what has come out of the White House in dribs and drabs and what was I think even more importantly in the president's FY 2018 budget is that they're really looking to do two things. They want to cut a whole bunch of infrastructure and other non-defense discretionary programs at the same time that they're calling for these uh, infrastructure uh, spending. And if we add up all the things they're talking about cutting, and compare that to what they're talking about spending, they're actually talking about cutting a dollar and 69 for every dollar of expenditure. So on net, this is a cut. And one of the biggest cuts that they're calling for uh, in the FY18 budget is to something called the Highway Trust Fund. And the Highway Trust Fund provides states and local transit operators with core funding every single year, uh, guaranteed by law. And that's more than $40 billion a year. Well, the Trump administration wants to cut that um, by about 37 percent annually, um, starting in fiscal 21 through the end of fiscal 2027. So that's a huge cut that would be very detrimental to states and to local transit operators. And that money that's lost would not be made up for with the spending that he's talking about as part of this plan. So what we see is that this is an extension of a lot of the other gimmicks and a lot of the other bait and switch that the Trump administration has put out over the years. Um, really, infrastructure is no different. Mm. 
you know, moving from, say, what is on the table to what could be on the table, in a recent article for the American Prospect, you describe what an infrastructure bill could actually accomplish and outline the principles that should guide it. Among them is a mandate that federal infrastructure funds should target the communities facing the greatest need. So what exactly would that look like? That's a great question. Um, I think too often what we end up building in this country is a product of uh, politics as opposed to a more objective assessment of need. And I think what we would like to see moving forward is some reforms to federal infrastructure spending that put very kind of objective measures out that says if you have, say, really old drinking water pipes and those drinking water pipes um, are at risk of contaminating the drinking water for, you know, families or at-risk populations, that's the kind of stuff that you've got to prioritize with your federal money. If you've got an existing bridge or an existing highway that has um, lots of potholes and has structural damage and needs to be rehabilitated or maybe just fully reconstructed, that you've got to go ahead and fix that first before you can move on to try to build something new. So what, what we'd like to see is money flowing to really objective identified needs and a little less so just based on political horse trading. Um, but from a broader I think progressive perspective, we would like to see a national infrastructure policy that really follows um, four criteria. We want that policy to be robust, comprehensive, equitable, and sustainable. So for us, that means uh, we would like to see a federal infrastructure policy that spends an additional $1 trillion in total uh, over the next 10 years. That's the robust. We want it to be comprehensive in that it needs to go beyond <clears throat> highways and bridges and, and public transportation, although those are obviously very important. It also needs to include drinking water, wastewater, western water storage uh, and distribution. That needs to be aviation, ports, inland waterways, affordable housing, clean energy, rural broadband. It needs to touch on all those sectors and probably a few others I'm forgetting at the moment. But then it also needs to just not spend money. It needs to be done equitably. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is sometimes lost in the conversation about infrastructure is that when you make an investment, when you build something, you deliver benefits, but you can also deliver burdens. So for instance, if you were to build new or expand a highway that connected to a busy container port, the shippers and the companies that move goods through that port would benefit. Uh, the truck drivers who haul loads in and out of the port would benefit. Consumers who get access to those products on the, on the shelves of their local stores would benefit. But the people who live on either side of that highway, some of whom may have had their homes taken, uh, and the folks who are left there still are going to have to breathe all the particulate matter from those diesel truck engines, they, they get the short end of that deal. They really get the burden. So... We want to focus on projects that not only have a compelling economic argument to be made for them through sort of a generic cost-benefit analysis, but also um, are as inclusive as they can possibly be. We want to make investments that provide people with safe and affordable access to jobs and education and health care, and we want projects that can, to the greatest extent possible, redress whether it's environmental damage or historical harms where neighborhoods were plowed under to put highways in or particular facilities created barriers that we can bring down now. So we want this to be equitable. We want it to provide as much opportunity. And then lastly, we want to really focus on protecting natural habitats, protecting communities uh, whenever possible, and, and also making sure that we live up to our long-term climate commitments. Because even though this administration would like to say that climate change is a, is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. We know that's not the case. And so because transportation projects have such a long-term impact that we have to start now, we have to start making the investments that are going to bring down our heat trap and gas emissions um, year over year. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Kevin DeGood, Director of Infrastructure Policy at American Progress, also the author of Thinking Outside the Fair Box, Creative Approaches to Financing Transit Projects. Kevin, another principle is this one. An infrastructure bill should train the next generation of workers while supporting good jobs that provide fair wages and benefits and ensure that companies respect worker voice on the job. 
How would that work? Well, you know, so often when we think about infrastructure, we tend to, to think about the assets that we're talking about building or repairing and forgetting that actual people have to do that work. Um, and these are some of the best jobs you can get, particularly if you're someone who uh, didn't want to go on or couldn't go on to higher education. You know, working in the heavy construction trades tends to pay well. Um, these are strong middle class jobs that you can support a family and and save for retirement and things like that. So these are the kinds of jobs that we want to see more of, but they don't just happen um, <clears throat> on their own. We do have to prepare people for them. These are skilled trades positions. And so we want to make sure that when we're thinking about expanding the amount of total infrastructure investment that we're making as a nation, that we recognize that that also means we have to be expanding the total number of people who have the skills and the training to go out and construct those projects that we want to see constructed. And so we have to be very intentional about setting aside uh, some of the money that we're talking about spending <clears throat> excuse me, to actually get people ready to go. Your principles include a mandate that an infrastructure bill include planning for extreme weather also. Now, yet we've seen in states such as Florida, North Carolina, the government employees have been discouraged from even using the words climate change or sea level rise. Um, those pesky scientists with their information. What type of impact do policies like these have on our ability to use infrastructure to build resilience? Well, I would say, you know, it's a sad state of affairs when we think that we can um, just stick our head in the sands and that that's going to make a problem as large as climate change go away. And that just isn't the case. So we have to start thinking about it seriously. We have to start planning for it. That means that federal and state and local officials have to be free to actually talk about it openly. Um, and I think what we really want to see is no more business as usual because there are um, some communities that are just because of their geography uh, a little more vulnerable to the effects of climate change, um, even sooner than some other places may be, they really have to start now thinking about how to make sure that the facilities they're building and reconstructing are going to be the strongest they can be to withstand um, the pressures that the kinds of major storms that we're going to see more of um, when those come about. They need to be able to withstand those uh, even more so than they can today. But we also need to think about maybe what are ways in which we can try to reduce the harm that those storms cause. That's going to be better land use and development policies, and maybe what are the infrastructure choices and investments we need to make to facilitate those better land use policies so that we have fewer um, individuals and businesses that are going to be in what is increasingly harm's way. So it's, it's not just about the infrastructure. It's about, I think, planning um, our communities and our economy a little more thoughtfully and recognizing the challenges that climate change presents. But infrastructure is certainly a part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, you also state that federal infrastructure funds should not personally benefit President Donald Trump, his family, his businesses, or his cabinet. Does it seem absurd that we should have to be even, to, that this should have to even be mentioned? <laughs> it is. This is truly something um, that is novel. I mean, presidents in the past have gone to a pretty extreme length to make sure that they did not have uh, obvious conflicts of interest. They were respectful of the decisions that uh, both watchdogs inside of the government, ethics officials inside the government, and also nonpartisan outside groups when they made recommendations uh, would follow them. But this administration has shown a total disregard for both the sort of black letter law as well as the broader norms of our democratic process. And so it's sad, but we have to say it now, and we're going to keep saying it, that whatever money uh, the Trump administration calls for spending, we have to make sure that it doesn't benefit him or his family or his business empire. And, and again, that's sad, but we just have to keep saying it because it has to be true. Mm -hmm. And of course, no matter what happens, and you mentioned money, one thing that will not change is the price tag. Infrastructure takes money. And yep. in the article that we've been referencing in the American Prospect, you know, you mentioned the T word, trillion, not billions. It's trillions of dollars that's necessary. That's a tough one for a lot of people, the, the public as, as well as any politician to swallow. So how likely is it that this administration and this Congress would commit the funds? I think it's not very likely, and I think that 
it's probably less likely now that the Congress, uh, that Republicans in Congress were so reckless in passing this tax uh, bill. You know, that tax legislation is going to increase our national debt by more than $1.5 trillion over the coming decade. Well, that same money could have been spent productively. It could have been spent rebuilding and expanding the facilities that allow our country to thrive and prosper and be competitive. Instead, the vast bulk of that um, money is just going to people who are the wealthiest in human history. So the Republicans have made a very clear and a very stark choice about what they value and what they valued was giving tax cuts to some very wealthy people. And I think we're also going to see as this debate about infrastructure continues on that they don't particularly uh, concern themselves with those kinds of long-term productive investments. But I hope to be proven wrong. And I think all of our listeners, as well as myself, hope that you're wrong as well. Kevin DeGood, Director of Infrastructure Policy at American Progress, also the author of Thinking Outside the Fair Box, Creative Approaches to Financing Transit Projects, joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Kevin, thank you very much for your time. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you. Take care. You as well. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Kyle Kondik, managing editor of Sabato's Crystal Ball. Yes, we are uh, no longer looking forward to 2018. We're in it. Uh, and it won't be long before we're right in the middle of the midterm elections. Kyle Kondik tra- tracks all this for the Center for American Politics down at the University of Center for Politics at the University of Virginia. Hey, Kyle. Good to see you. How are you doing? Doing well. All right. Um, what, certainly, the everybody was looking at the State of the Union for uh, how it might help Republicans or help Democrats, right? <laughs> Uh, what, what? How would you assess the impact? Uh, it's interesting that there were, you know, those snap polls come out the night, you know, yeah, the night of. Yeah. And, and by the way, they're and, always pretty positive, aren't they? they yeah, that's the point I was going to make. Is, oh. is CNN actually included its twenty year history of of the polls they had done, and they yeah. were always positive because what happens is that. Um, the electorate is always skewed toward, or it's not the viewership is always skewed toward the, pr- the the president, and so you would expect members of the president's party to have a positive outlook on his on his performance, yeah. and that's yeah. what happened with Trump. But it happened, you know, you go back and look at, uh, you know, Obama in 2010, he had great numbers for that, and you know the Democrats did did poorly in the midterm. So I don't think it really means all that much. And you know, we were just talking before we came on on before the after the, during the break. Um, that, you know, there's just so much stuff happening on a day-to-day basis that um, I think the speech is probably going to be forgotten in a couple of days. Uh, right. Even though I did think, um, and, you know, I'm sure you've, you've gone over this the, the speech at, at length, you know, yesterday and, and what have you, but, um, uh, you know, I thought the, the, the tone on immigration was very hard-edged, uh, and I don't, I almost felt like it was sort of poisoning the well. I, I don't, I have a hard time seeing how they get something done on immigration just because the, part, the, the, the parties are so far apart on it. The problem – one of the problems is uh, is that Donald Trump cannot talk about immigration without branding immigrants as criminals, rapists, and murderers. Yeah. So for him – and we know that's how he started his campaign, um, the famous uh, lobby of Trump Tower speech when he announced – uh, but even in the State of the Union, when he was talking about immigrants, he was talking about MS-13. That was his right. whole focus, right? Now, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, get rid of the MS-13 as far as I'm concerned, whatever. Uh, no sympathy for them. But um, not all immigrants are members of MS-13. Yeah. And not all MS-13 members are here illegally. Right. And by the way, you know, there are a lot more people every day killed in the streets of Chicago by gangs, teen gangs. I mean, it, but for him, immigrant equals crime. Right. And it's this sort of uh, 
basically kind of nasty nativist uh, sentiment that I think he's expressed for for a long doesn't, time here. Doesn't and, help bring people together. No, and I, yeah, I remember I, was, I I went back and looked at some of the the pre speech expectations after you know after the fact, and I saw a quote from Jeff Flake, of course, the retiring Arizona senator who is one of the Republicans who I think legitimately wants to get some sort of deal done on immigration. And he was talking about how he was going to measure the speech based on whether Trump's Trump spoke sort of from the heart, like he said, you know, basically said sort of conciliatory things about dreamers. Yeah. And boy, he did not. No. Um, and so based on that expectation, you know, this was, uh, again, uh, I, a hard edge as, as I've been describing. And it. I've had this debate with conservative friends, but the, the phrase Americans are dreamers, too was not meant in a positive sense. No. no. It no. was a and, put down of dreamers and, and you and, cannot And if you look at if you look at the rhetoric that's used toward uh the dreamers uh mm-hmm. um by I think by by Trump and also by Republicans I mean again I think it's I think it's pretty hard edged. I mean, you know, that's th- that's where we're at in this in this uh debate but sort of asking Trump to preside over some sort of path to citizenship for the the dreamers. It's. I mean, it's almost like a, you know, Nixon, only Nixon could go to China sort of yeah, moment. Um, right. And I, I don't. I just don't know if it's going to happen or not. By the way, on the numbers you started there, and I, I, I just checked. I saw this in the New York Times earlier. Um, there were forty five point six. Donald Trump said ahead of time that we would ha- he would have the largest audience. Well, he tweeted this morning that he did too, but of course it wasn't true. Not true. Yeah. No. Uh, oh, he tweeted it. This yeah, he, he, he said he ahead said of time he said, he'd have the biggest audience ever. Yeah. Yeah. That's not. It's not true. So actually, the numbers are just that facts do matter. By the way, there's some of us who still believe that facts do matter. Uh, so 45.6 million people. By the way, that's a huge audience. This is a huge audience. Yeah. Right. It's two million fewer than watched. Uh, if, Rounded to 46, 48 million people watched his first address to a joint session of Congress, yeah. and 48 million people watched Barack Obama's first State of the Union. So uh, it's still good, but for, yeah, the and fact you, is, and you could, you, it was, and I'm not, it, I'm only mentioning it because no, it's he, a pro, it's a it's a great audience, particularly in a, in a yeah. time of uh, of uh, very splintered media. Although of course, you know, everybody shows it or, or all the the, the big right. networks and cable. By the way, those but, are just TV numbers, but, not. Streaming them. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is that um, y- y- just talking about sort of a partisan audience, you know, Fox Fox News had a way bigger audience for this than, yeah. than MSNBC. 11 and, and, a half million. and, you know, Fox gets really good ratings, too. But, I mean, that just shows that the, the sort of disparity in it. And, that you know, that was true for Obama, too. Right. All right. So here we are. We're in 2018. Um, is there a path for, as some people say, for Democrats to take back the house. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that I think overall that the house is about 50-50 to flip at this point. Really? Um many others are, are actually more more bullish on that I than I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just not ready to go that far. I think that, you know, it, it, there are um the you know the the seat by seat path is kind of it's kind of challenging and I, I I sort of went through that in our crystal ball newsletter this morning. Right. Just try tried to find roughly 25 seats to flip. And I mean they they're there. Uh it's That's just the you know, number 24 25. So the, the the actual number is 24 but that is Assumes the Democrats don't lose any of their own seats, which oh. you know usually even in a good year you lose you lose something um, that that you already hold. So I went through it assuming they needed to, to net to, to win twenty five Republican held seats, and what I came up with was that basically half the seats would come from probably California and then the Northeast, so like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York, uh, and also that um, roughly as I put it, about an equal number of the seats would probably have to come from. Clinton won districts. There are 23 of those overall. Clinton won districts held so, by Republicans. So 25 seats they'd have to pick up that are now held by Republicans. Yes. And how many How many seats are there that Hillary won? Uh, uh, 23. 23. There are 23 Republicans who sit in Clinton won seats. And then there are 12 Democrats who sit in Trump won seats. And, uh, you know, so, it, so it's going to be... You know, there like for instance, there's a bunch of seats in in California that went f- that flipped from Romney to Clinton. Those mm-hmm. are obvious targets, uh, and some of them are among the best targets for Democrats. Like Daryl Issa retired in, yeah. in Southern yeah. California. Yeah. Yeah. That's a seat that Clinton won. That's a seat the Democrats should win. But you know, then there's then there are a few in Texas that are that are sort of Clinton won seats. There are a few in New Jersey. There are, you know a few in some other places. But then there are also some seats where Obama might have won the seat, but then Trump won it, and those are still have to be targets too. Uh, now I forget the exact number, but the average. This is a first midterm mm-hmm. of this new administration. Um, 
the party in power usually loses seats in That's the right. midterm, an average of about 33, so, 35, so something the, like that. So the, the post in, in – since the Civil War, which is basically the entire history of our two-party system because, yeah, the, yeah. you know, Democrats, Republicans emerge as the two parties by 1856 um, – you have 39 midterms since then. In 36 of them, the president's party has lost ground in the House, and the average loss is 33 seats. 33. Yeah. yeah. And so by that metric, um, you know, de- Democrats would just have to perform below the average to do it. Now, um, it, you know, some of the biggest years for, for t- seat switches are like in the 1890s, which is, you know, just a totally different kind of era. Um, both in the way we voted and, you know, women couldn't even vote back then. I mean, it's just, diff- it's just so different. So if the average loss for the party in power is 33 and Democrats only ne- need to pick up 25, why do you only rate their chances 50-50? Because of the specific map, because I'm also leery of sort of going out on a limb nine months before the election. Like, I just, I, you know, I could see the scenario where the Republicans sort of kind of slowly gain in a little bit of strength. You know, the generic ballot contracts a little bit. The Democrats have been consistently leading, but but it's actually contracted a little bit lately. Um, Trump's approval may be going from, you know, 40 to 43 or something. And then, you, you know, it might be that the, the Republicans only lose like 15 seats or 20 seats, and then that's not good enough. So I'm, I'm being cautious. You know, if I had to pick it today, I'd probably pick the Democrats to win the House, but I don't want to you know, I don't want to lean into that too much. Uh, could it also be that the Democrats are well known for not being able to organize a two car funeral? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that's I think that's that right. Democrats could blow it. Yeah. And, and you know, also on one hand, the Democrats have like a historically large number of candidates running in districts all across the country. But and so that's good. But, you know, a lot of these folks are unproven. They're you know, they're people who haven't well, been elected before and they may have, you know, dirty laundry that can come out. Uh, and they're also going to be very competitive primaries. But are the Democrats doing what they need to do? Meaning, do they have – are they raising the money? Well, let's start. Do they have candidates in all of these districts, good in, candidates? In, in almost every district, they have candidates who appear credible on paper. Right. Not uh-huh. all of them, but most of them. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, yeah. For, as a Democrat. And are they raising the money? Do they have the resources? And Yeah. Um, we're uh, just yesterday was the, the uh, filing deadline for the uh, Q four, quarter, fourth quarter fundraising reports. So some of those have already come out, but um, I want to take a closer look at those. But the Democrats have been raising good money. In fact, there have been many Democratic candidates who have been out raising their Republican um, uh, you know, incumbents, which is which is really pretty good. Right. And there have been a lot of retirements. Uh, Peter's favorite member of Congress, uh, Trey Gowdy. Yes, from my home state. From your home, his home <laughs> state of South Carolina. By the way, I, I, I don't like to get into personal appearances, but he still <laughs> is the weirdest looking person I have ever seen. I He's think. had several interesting Outside haircuts. of a circus. He's had several interesting yeah. haircuts. And a head. Here. He's got a head. I, I, I feel sorry for any barber that tries to cut his hair. There's no way you this can. This is why I just play it safe, you know. <laughs> <There> you <laughs> Those watching on video can, can <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. 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 yeah there's no um, way to screw that up, Kyle. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, so, Gowdy, that, but that's a Republican yeah, so, red seat. Red so, as of right now, um, based on the way we calculated. There have been a lot of retirements. There have been a ton, yeah. So, there are, there are um, as of this point, there are going to be 50. House seats that do not have an incumbent on the ballot um, this year. That does not include um, there. There are going to be three special elections in Republican held seats, including one in Pennsylvania coming up next month. I don't include that in the fifty because that district will have an incumbent on the ballot in November. So wait a minute. These are fifty seats, Republican seats. No, fifty, 50 overall that don't have an incumbent, and thirty-four of them are held by Republicans. So two thirds are and sixteen are Democratic. Now most of those seats are not competitive in a general election sense. Gowdy's seat, uh, Trump won that that seat by I think more than thirty points. Um, uh, or it was 25 to 30, I don't remember specifically, but that's not really a, 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 a real target. Um, there was another retirement yesterday, Bob Brady, of the sort of the, the Democratic boss of Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, he decided yeah. to retire. His district is a zillion points Democratic, although um, Pennsylvania may have a new House map, so who knows. But um, but of those 50, you'd probably expect the Democrats to, to try to net at least a half a dozen seats from that group, just group of the, just the open seats. And open seats are, you know, very important because yeah. they're just easy, easier to win. Uh, and there are a number of Clinton yeah. won open, you know, Republican seats. And those almost always flip in this sort of midterm environment. All right. I haven't done um, the analysis, but it seems to me, tell me if I'm wrong, just seems that there have been more Republican retirements 
announced recently than Democratic. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, and, and look, I mean, obviously the Republicans and have— so why? Well— They're in power. Do you so think they want to stay? There are a number of factors. I think the midterm environment is part of it. You have a lot of senior members who basically have come from safe seats that aren't really safe anymore. Like Rod Freilinghouse. Freilinghouse is a great example. In, in New um, Jersey. In, you know, he was—I don't think he'd really ever had a hard race— Uh, And he was in for one this time, uh, regardless. And also, the Republicans have uh, term limits for their committee chairman. And a number of the committee chairmen are leaving because they're going to lose their term. They were going to lose their chairmanship or they just lost their chairmanship. Frailing is an, an interesting uh, counterpoint. Appro- appropriations. Be, and he it. just he just took that. So he you know, he, yeah. he would have a few more terms to be uh, to be the chairman. And so, you know, I would I mean. A lot of these members, I mean, not all of them are sharp, but a lot of them are very sharp and they're very politically savvy because they have to be. And, you know, they may have a sense as to which way the wind is blowing. And, you know, they either don't want to go back to just being a rank and file member after having a high profile chairmanship or even worse, they don't want to be a rank and file member in the minority, which is not a lot of fun in the House. Uh, you mentioned this earlier in passing. I'm going to come back to the fact that California could really provide the kind of the rocket you know, that, that sends the Democrats over the top. If you look just at Orange County, California, the territory I know, being sure. a former Democratic chair of California. Um, so Darrell Issa st- stepping down. Mm-hmm. That's a seat Democrats really should pick. Ed Royce yep. stepping down, Orange County. Dana Rohrabacher clearly will have the fight of his life, I think, yep. this year, mm-hmm. right? Um, not even, not all conservatives like Dana, Dana Rohrabacher's right. style of conservatism. Is, and... Uh, there's another a woman, Mimi Walters, Mimi Walters, is another is Orange County seat, that, like the most one of the most vulnerable of all the Republican so, seats. If the, Democrats pick up even three, but four seats out of Orange County, California, I mean, yeah. Katie bar the door. Well, so the Democrats already control 39 of 53 seats in California. And yet they probably need several more to make the math work nationally. Now, two of them, I think, are not necessarily easy pickups, but but seats that they're, they're probably better than 50-50 to win. And those are um, the, the ISA and Royce seats that are now open. And then there is a group of five more incumbents who are vulnerable to certain degrees. You mentioned some of them, Dana Rohrabacher, Mimi Walters, uh, David Valadeo, who represents a uh, kind of rural majority Hispanic uh, district, Jeff Denham, who is a battleground seat in, in uh, near Sacramento. Um, and uh, I'm I'm blanking on the other one, but Devin Nunez, his his seats his seats more Republican. Although he he may also he probably will have a, a you know a real challenger. But um, the the Democrats, I, I, the way I sketched it out in my my sort of roadmap this morning is I thought the Democrats needed to net five more seats out of California. Hmm. So two would be those open ones probably, and then a combination of beating some incumbents, which you know I think is plausible. But you know some of the as, as you well know, I mean Orange County is almost sort of the 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 the, the, oh. uh, the the um, uh, where where modern conservatism sort of came from, Absolutely. really, yeah. and uh, Clinton yeah. was the first Democrat to win Orange County since FDR in thirty six. Um, so you know the, the what some Republicans in California and neutral observers believe too is that the Clinton numbers in those districts do not represent the actual down ballot Republican strength. Um, I think well, I personally think the Clinton numbers are a leading indicator, and that a lot of those members are in trouble. But we'll see. We uh, had our first victory in in in, Cal- in Orange County. Uh, we used to call it going behind the orange curtain <laughs> uh, and with um, Loretta Sanchez when she beat B one Bob Dorner yeah. Dornan, and then uh, of course her sister was later elected to Congress. And um, let's talk. Uh, so the other number about the House when in 2010 when John Boehner won, or when Republicans won, and John Boehner became Speaker. Republicans won, so that was Barack Obama's first yeah. midterm. 63 net seats. Exactly, 63. So, I mean, 25. It's not that crazy. Certainly not that crazy. Not no, that historically. crazy. Historically. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing about the Democrats in in, um, the, in 2010 the was— Boehner landslide, the, 63. The, the Democrats were way overextended. You know, they, they had—going into 2010, they controlled the majority of the seats in Tennessee. They had, they had three of the four seats in Mississippi. They had seats in— you know, dark red, Alabama, Arkansas, um, you know, the the Republicans are not that exposed. And that's why, you know, the Democrats yeah. picked up 30 in 2006. I think that's like a pretty reasonable goal. And I certainly think I get that. In fact, 
if the wave is big enough, it could be more like 40 or 45, but it could also be 15, <laughs> which is why I'm, you know, yeah, I, and I, I'd be oh. I'd be surprised if it wasn't double digits anyway. Right. So we have to take a look at the Senate. If you're 50-50 in the House, what are you in the Senate? Less than 50-50 in the Senate because the Senate map is so difficult for Democrats. Um, but they've had some breaks, right? They've had def- Doug Jones is a break, right? Doug, the, Doug, is, is Doug Jones up again this year? No. Okay. Uh, he is. So he, a, yeah. he gets to serve three years, and he's up in 2020, which will be a very hard seat to keep. But at least it's banked for Democrats now. Um, so the Senate's 51 49. Right. They got a uh, break yesterday in the sense uh, the Justice Department. Um, two weeks after they said we're going to go back after Robert Menendez, yesterday they said we're dropping all charges. Yeah. Um, certainly, in you know New Jersey's a seat, a state you'd expect to elect a Democrat to the Senate in this kind of environment, so he should he should be fine despite his uh, despite his baggage. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know some of these other Democratic incumbents um, from states that Trump won, I think are actually in, in better shape now. Bob Casey in Pennsylvania looks pretty good. His Republican opponent Lou Barletta, who's a congressman, has had a lot of problems and isn't really raising money. Debbie Stabenow does not have a credible challenger in Michigan as of now. Um, so the, the the field is some of the, I think the Democrats are going to be able to take some of these seats sort of off the board. I think maybe the two seats in Minnesota two look pretty good for them to hold. Amy Klobuchar is probably going to win by a zillion points, and uh, Tina Smith, the new incumbent who placed Al, Al Franken, is, is she running? She's on the ballot. Yeah, so she she said she wasn't going to run. No, she life. she um, part of the reason oh. she uh, got the appointment was they twisted her arm so that she would run again. But uh, Minnesota seems like it'll be pretty good for the Democrats this time. So, you know, there's still a lot of seats to defend, but it's not like double digits that are really at risk. It's so funny. Like, I'm old enough to remember the Barack Obama midterms where there had there were uh, uh, Democrats who were too scared to run with him because his approval rating was a shockingly low 49 percent. Yeah. And yeah. so now you've got these Republicans who are going to figure out how they're going to run with a head of their party right. that is at a historic Low. Well, let me let me make this point too. So so you know, well, let's assume that Trump's approval rating nationally is forty percent, or you know, give give or take. That's what the averages say. Um, if you go but if you go state by state, and actually Gallup just put out some state by state approval numbers uh, for the president, the president is you know under water in approval in almost every state, or probably 85 percent of the states, including some states that voted for him heavily, like. You know, Ohio, for instance, Trump won it by eight points. His approval was minus five in Ohio. Um, even in like Missouri and Indiana, which are states that um, have become pretty Republican, Trump's approval is underwater there too. And so, in a lot, in a lot of these states, um, even even states that Trump won by a lot, his approval is bad. And what Republicans are going to have to do is convince probably at least some people who disapprove of Trump to vote against their incumbent Democratic senator. That. That seems like a hard task in in a mid in a midterm environment. Uh huh. So uh, the ones that you, we hear that could be in trouble, the ones the red state Democrats, we always have to look the other way because we know they have to vote for <laughs> kind of things. Uh, the, uh, Claire McCaskill. Yep. Joe Donnelly. Joe Manchin. Heidi Heitkamp. Heidi Heitkamp John, John Tester. Yeah. Right. They're the five. Uh, are any of them in serious trouble? I I think McCaskill is. Um, really. But her um, she seems the strongest of the. Th- um, to me, but she, you know, she's probably the most liberal of the five, and so probably the, the the poorest fit for her state. But she's also benefited, you know, she benefited from Todd Akin in 2012. Oh, yeah, yeah, and she's probably going to face the state attorney general, this younger guy named Josh Hawley, who um, actually didn't raise that much money last. I mean, it was under a million dollars, which actually isn't that good for a Senate quarter. And he also made he, he was in some dust up yesterday talking about how. You know, human trafficking was basically caused by the sexual revolution of the 1960s, um, uh, which is not is uh, it certainly is not what Aiken said, but yeah. is the kind of sort of I hot know, button cultural of, thing yeah, that yeah. that um, you know can Shh, idiot. maybe people raise their eyebrows at. So, um, and Democrats got a break in Tennessee. Yeah, the with, former governor Phil Bredesen is running. That's a really tough state for them, but um, at least it sort of puts it on the board. It's an open seat. Bob Corker retired. I think Beto O'Rourke has like kind of a puncher's chance in Texas against mm, Ted Cruz. Really? Uh, oh, no, that I mean, would be, yeah. you know, yeah. Cruz is definitely favored right, by a right. lot, but um, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be some sort of runaway. And at the very least, O'Rourke is raising real money and and is running a real campaign. 
and then you've got Arizona and Nevada, which are uh, Arizona's an open seat. Dean mm-hmm. Heller's running in Nevada. Those are 50-50 or maybe even better to flip to the Democrats, I think. Right. So there is a path. It's just a tougher path. The Democrats a have to narrow path. hold all yeah. their incumbents and then pick up two Republican seats, probably Arizona and Nevada. Okay. Hey, Kyle. My God, what a great, uh, great roundup there of uh, how chances look in 2018. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks, Bill. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Janelle Jones, Kevin DeGood, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.